I have my lovely assistant here handing me my Bible. Thank you, sweetie. I appreciate that. Well, it was not too long ago I saw a poster. I think posters can be interesting. You go to a doctor's office and you see posters up in the doctor's office or maybe you go to a school, a middle school or a little elementary school and they'll see posters hanging up on the wall. I always like looking at those. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're inspiring or they're interesting. There's one poster I saw that maybe you've seen it. I think it's a pretty popular one, but I still think about what this poster says. It said, everything I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> Have you ever seen that poster? I, I saw it and I just thought, huh. I think maybe there was a book as well, maybe that had that title. Uh, I've never read the book. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. I can't, I, I don't know. So, so don't come to me for that. I think I'm getting a thumbs up in the back saying that it's a pretty good book uh, from a teacher. So I'll, I'll take his word for it. But I always remember uh, that line, everything I ever needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. And I think there can be some truths to that. We, we learn how to, first off, just have a schedule, be responsible, do what we're told, um, take naps, share, you know, all, all those basic things. But I remember when I was a kindergartner, there's, my memory of kindergarten, I'm going to admit, is murky. My memory of what I had for breakfast last week is murky. But I'm trying to remember kindergarten and some of the things I learned. And there's a specific memory that really stands out for me. And maybe you had something similar to this when you were just a little kid in grade school. But for me, something I remember was that a big deal in kindergarten were the cards. Okay? Now, you may not know what I mean when I say the cards, but I know what I mean. And all the kids that went to Greencastle Elementary, they know what I mean when I say the cards. Because in every class, it didn't matter who your teacher was, in kindergarten through first grade and second grade, they had this card system where every kid had a little name on a big piece of cardboard and a little pouch under their name and in every pouch was a green card. And a green card meant everything was okay. That, hey, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're being a good boy, you're being a good girl. What you didn't want was for the teacher to walk over and take out the green card and put in the yellow card. That's bad news. That means that you did something wrong. It means you made a mistake, you were goofing off, you weren't listening, whatever, and you knew that the teacher recognized it and that you were in trouble because she put in the yellow card. That you did not want a yellow card. Because if you did it again, the yellow card was kind of your first warning. If you did it again, she took out the yellow card and she put in an orange card. And if you see her put in the orange card, okay, well, now you're starting to get nervous because, hey, you started out as green, now you got the yellow, now you got the orange, and what you really don't want is you really don't want the red. I think if you got the orange card, I think you had to stay inside for recess, you know, so that wasn't fun. But that would have still been better than getting the red card, the third and final strike, because if you get the third strike, that means that they call your parents. You still have to sit inside for recess, which at that point, most kids would happily do if you didn't have to call mom and dad. But if you got the red card, that meant you had your warning, you had your second warning, you're not listening, and now you get the red card. And no kid ever wanted that. I don't know if I ever got the red card. I hope my parents aren't watching right now. Maybe I did. I was pretty easy to scare as a little kid. So I think I was mostly a green and yellow, you know, maybe an orange every now and then kind of kid. But I don't know if I ever got the red card. But the reason why I bring that up is because I think that's something that I learned from kindergarten, whether good or bad, was this sense of um, you only get so many tries. You, you make a mistake and, well, if you make it again, then you're in big trouble. Or if you make it three times, well, then you're out. You know, it's kind of like baseball. Three strikes and you're out. And all throughout school, and I think even in life, we kind of create this system for us uh, that is based on like a strike system. 
you get into a job and you have to read the manual and it talks about these different things that happen uh, in discipline that if you do something wrong, maybe you get put on probation or maybe you get a formal warning. And, and, and we just, we exist in this world or in this life where you're only allowed to mess up so many times until something really bad happens. You can only get so many violations on your driver's license before it's taken away. And I think that's all good. I'm not I'm not saying that that's bad or, or that that's not a good thing, but I think something that we do as a result of growing up in a world built that way is that we think that God is the same way. We think that God is kind of like our kindergarten teacher and that we all have the little cards underneath our name. And we hope that we all have a green card in heaven and that God's looking at the board and if he finds my name, you hope it's a green card. But sometimes we mess up and, okay, well, maybe a few of us have yellow cards with God. I think sometimes we think that way. Or sometimes people say, you know, Stephen, I've had a really bad year. Or I've really fallen off the wagon in this area of my life. Or I've really fallen into this really bad thing. And so maybe I have an orange card. But people sometimes think that God has a limit to how much you're allowed to sin before he gets rid of you. That, that, that we think that we're only allowed to maybe get away with so much. Uh, sometimes I've had people come up to me, and maybe you've heard people say this. Maybe you've said it. Where people just say, you know, I can't be a Christian. I've sinned too much. I've done too much wrong. People think that way. I've thought that way sometimes in my life. Uh, maybe you've had moments where, where you just feel like you've done too much and that you've done so many wrong things or you've made the same mistake so many times that you've disqualified yourself. And I want to say that that's wrong. Today we're going to look at a story of a guy who makes the same mistake twice. We're going to look at a character who we hope that he's becoming a better person, but we don't really see him really becoming a better person. And we're going to see how God is going to react to this individual when he continues to make the same mistakes. And I think what we're going to find here is we're not necessarily going to discover in Genesis 20 necessarily how to become better people, but we are going to understand how God is a better God than maybe we previously thought. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 20. We are done with Sodom and Gomorrah. I think I heard that sigh of relief coming out of Bayview all, all at once as, as I said that. We're done with Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is ashes. We are done with Lot. His story is sadly over. And we are now returning to this man named Abraham and to his wife named Sarah. And we're going to see how God in chapter 21, we're only a week away He's going to give them exactly what they've been hoping for. He's going to give them Isaac. He's going to give them a baby. He's going to do this awesome miracle in, this, in their life that's going to start the rest of Old Testament history. That's going to lead to the nation of Israel. Next week's going to be an awesome passage. But before we get to that great example of God's blessing and God's miracle, for whatever reason, in the life of Abraham, we're going to see a chapter where we focus solely on the fact that Abraham struggles, that he's going to make a mistake. And not only is he going to make a mistake, he's going to make the same mistake that he had made before. And the reason for that is if you're reading in verse 20, you'll start at verse 1 and maybe you'll kind of scan through. Uh, you'll notice that there's going to be things about the story that sound familiar. It says that Abraham in verse 1 journeyed uh, he's journeying south right now. Uh, he's at the Oaks of Mamre. Now, that was about central Israel. I think we have a map, actually, that we could throw up. Um, he's in the central land of Canaan, kind of near the city of Hebron. But he's leaving that area. He's traveling south uh, to a place called the Negev uh, between Kadesh and Shur. I think those might, those might show up on the map. And it says that he sojourned in a place called Gerar. And in verse 2, Abraham says to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, this guy named Abimelech, the king of Gerar, he sent and he took Sarah. Now, I want you to maybe think of a time where maybe you're laying on the couch, you're flipping through the channels, you're looking for something to watch, and, 
and you come up on some show, okay? Maybe it's an old show, I Love Lucy, Andy Griffith, maybe something like that. And you turn on the show and you go, hey, I've seen this one before. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the one where Lucy, yeah, she goes and oh, yeah, she does that thing. Oh, yeah, I've seen this. This is a rerun. This is a rerun of something that I've already seen. Well, in some ways, you may be looking at this chapter going, oh, no, 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 wait a second. I've seen this one before, Stephen. I've seen this passage before. Oh, yeah, this is the one where Abraham lies. He says that his wife is his sister because he's afraid that someone's going to kill him. So he's going to let them take his wife as their wife. And he's just going to lie and pretend that's his sister. We've seen this one before, Stephen. No, 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 no. This isn't a rerun, okay? What's happening here in chapter 20 is Abraham making the same exact mistake that we saw him make at the beginning of our series. He's doing it again. And what's interesting is that sometimes when you do some research on this passage, you will see a lot of scholars believe firmly. They will insist that this is actually just the same story told from two different perspectives that whoever put together Genesis in their mind decided to just put in twice. They're convinced that this is just one event because for whatever reason, they can't imagine that Abraham could make the same mistake twice. Now, these people who make these claims, they've made the same mistake twice. You've made the same mistake twice. I've made the same mistake twice. And really, I wish that I had only made my mistakes twice. The mistakes I make, I'm usually making a dozen times, 50 times, a hundred times. If someone was to look at my life, I mean, good grief. Imagine if my life had been written down on a piece of paper and thousands of years later, people are studying it and they're going, nope, nope, nope. There's no way that Stephen did this this many times. Nope, there's no way. This must just be one event. There's no way that Stephen is this stupid to make that same mistake over and over again. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's what the story of my life would be. People would be insisting that uh, all these repeated instances of my sin were somehow just a, a copy and paste error. But no, uh, in my case, it would be that I'm just a sinner. And actually, that's going to be the same case here for Abraham. Abraham is showing the same selfishness. He's showing the same pride. He's showing the same deceitfulness. And he's showing the same fear and lack of faith that he showed the first time. And I think this is so important because sometimes I think we think that the problem is that, well, sometimes we make mistakes. I think sometimes parents do that a lot. I'm not a parent, so I have no right to talk. But, but I think sometimes uh, parents will say, well, he's a good kid, he just made a mistake. Or, oh, well, they just did this one thing that, this one time. Or, oh, they, yeah, okay, they, they screwed up in this area. And that's fine, and that's true, and there's forgiveness, and there's redemption from those things. But the problem with people is not that we make mistakes, it's that we are mistake-prone people. It's not just that, well, we sin every now and then. The problem is that we are sinners. What we're finding here in chapter 20, and even these first few verses, is that the problem with Abraham is not just that he has these lapses of a lack of faith and um, in the spur of the moment he makes a dumb decision. No, we're finding a pattern in Abraham's heart. We're finding a repeated set of instances that is showing not just Abraham's mistakes, but it's showing Abraham's character. And it's showing that Abraham's character is really not all that great. Again, a second time, Abraham quickly was willing to sacrifice the dignity of his wife in order to protect himself. We have to be very careful, okay? I want to be very careful. We only know that Abraham does this two times. The fact that Abraham was so quick to do it two times, though, even after knowing what happened the first time, to me, and this is just, you know, close the Bible. This is just some guy talking right now. It's hard for me not to imagine that this is just how Abraham treated his wife. Okay? Um, when I was a teacher, that was the oldest trick in the book. Um, if you saw someone, if you saw a kid doing something bad one time, okay. If you see him doing it twice, 
Well, that shows that there's probably a hard attitude right now happening in this student that, that needs to be fixed. Uh, if they were so quick to make the mistake once and then even twice, that means that there's something going on in their heart and their attitude that they're just comfortable sinning right now in a way that they shouldn't be comfortable. I'm going to say that I believe that that's what's happening with Abraham. Uh, and I'll admit that there's no verse that tells me that, but what I'm saying is that the Bible has gone out of its way to specifically show that Abraham has made the same mistake and a pretty bad mistake twice. And this is after he's talked to God. This is after he's heard from God. This is after God has done some pretty incredible things from him. He is still falling into this pattern. We need to hear that because we need to recognize that sin is more than just a problem that we sometimes commit is a problem with who we are. It's a problem with who we are deep down inside. And just as much as that is true for us, in this case, it's also true for Abraham. So let's see what happens. He does the same thing that he did with Pharaoh. This time he's doing it with another guy named Abimelech. This is a Canaanite king that's living in the southern land of Canaan. And he makes the same mistake. Uh, Sarah gets taken by this king and Abraham is spared. Don't you think Abraham should have thought about the promise that God made of sparing him and preserving him and blessing him? You would, you would hope that he would have rested on that promise, but instead he decides to rest on his sin, which... I've done that. Maybe you've done that. But anyways, verse 4, it says, Now Abimelech had not approached her, which is just a nice way of saying that he hadn't slept with her. And so he said, uh, Lord, will you kill an innocent person? And I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. Uh, let's go to verse 3. Uh, Abimelech, he takes Sarah. Uh, he had not touched her. He had not approached her. Uh, but he's sleeping in the night. And in verse 3, God says to Abimelech in a dream, and he says, Behold, you are a dead man. If you wake up in the night under any circumstance and you hear a voice say, You are as good as a dead man, that's a bad night, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter what situation that is. If you wake up in the night or you are sleeping and you hear someone say that you are as good as a dead man, that is bad news. God is coming to Abimelech saying, Hey, buddy. You're dead meat. And this is where we get to the verse where Abimelech says, Hey, whoever you are, I didn't do it. Don't give me the yellow card, God, all right? I didn't come near to Sarah. Are you going to kill me and an innocent group of people that I lead uh, when we didn't do anything wrong? That's what he's saying in verse 4. Verse 5, he continues, he said, Did he not himself say to me, this is Abimelech talking, he's saying, Didn't that guy Abraham, Sarah's brother, didn't he say to me that she is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother. So Sarah is involved in this too. In the integrity of my heart, this is verse 5, and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Verse 6, Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. There's something interesting happening in this passage that I hope you guys notice. Uh, look at the way that Abimelech was talking to the Lord. Uh, look at what Abimelech has done so far up to this point. Look at what's going to happen in the following verses, starting in verse 8. It says that Abimelech, he rises up early in the morning. He goes to Abraham. He says, why have you done this to me? How have I sinned against you? Uh, why have you brought these bad things on me? Abimelech's the good guy in this passage, and Abraham's the bad guy. We're going to see later on as we move through, Abimelech, he's going to apologize up and down. He's going to give Abraham nice things. Uh, he's going to add apology onto apology. Now, it's never really a good thing to just be taking women and adding them to their harem. We're not going to pretend that that's good. But in the context of the situation, Abimelech had done what 
arguably in the ancient times was his right to do what was appropriate for him to do. Abraham had multiple wives in a sense. Uh, other people are going to have multiple wives. God is not condoning that, but this is the reality right now. And it was Abraham who had lied and swindled, and it was Abimelech who was going out of his way to try to do the right thing. It's Abimelech who's the good guy right now, and it's Abraham who is the bad guy. So let's catch up with the story. Abimelech says to Abraham in verse 10, he says, what did you see that you did this thing? And look at Abraham's response. This sleazy little guy, Abraham says, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. So he starts out by blaming Abimelech, okay? Abraham says, hey, the only reason I did it is because I thought you guys were just so bad and nasty that I had to. So he immediately shifts blame. Just like Adam immediately shifted blame in the garden and Eve immediately shifted blame, Abraham is trying to defend himself by accusing Abimelech when Abimelech has done nothing wrong. And he says in verse 12, he says, besides, here's kind of the merchant businessman Abraham coming out. He says, besides, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father though not the daughter of my mother. She's my sister from another mom. She's my half-sister. I didn't lie. After all, besides, she is actually my sister. And, well, she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do me at every place. See that? At every place to which we come, say of me, He is my brother. Abraham is being a swindler right now. As we move through this series in the book of Genesis, we're going to see that that is a trait that is passed down through the family of men being deceitful, being tricky to try to take advantage of other people for their own personal gain. That's what Abraham is doing here. And Abimelech is just trying to do what's right. We see that in verse 14. It says that Abimelech, he takes sheep, he takes oxen, he takes servants, he takes female servants, and he gives them to Abraham. Wait a second, shouldn't Abraham be giving the stuff to Abimelech here? Isn't it, isn't it Abimelech who did uh, the right thing? And it's Abraham that did the wrong. Shouldn't Abraham be offering some of the stuff? But no, Abraham did the wrong thing, and he is getting blessed by it regardless. Abimelech says in verse 15, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother. I, I kind of like that from Abimelech, that, that, that he specifically calls Abraham Sarah's brother. He says, I've given your brother, I think that's kind of passive aggressive, a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. It says then that Abraham prayed to God and that God healed Abimelech. We don't really know what was wrong with Abimelech at this point. And also healed his wife and his female servants so that they could all have kids. Because when Abimelech did that thing, in verse 18, it says that God closed the wombs of all the women in his house. (sighs) I'm a fairness kind of guy. You know, we talk about things that we learn from kindergarten. I learned a sense of playground fairness. I feel like as a little kid, we want things to be fair. We want things to be right. And there's something about this that just doesn't seem quite right. It seems like Abraham is being tricky. He's lying. He's swindling. And how does this all end? It ends with Abimelech having a sickness, his women having their wombs closed, and Abraham getting off with land and a thousand pieces of silver. Why would that be the case? I think there's a lot of little twists and turns that we can make to try to make sense of this passage, but I think we have to look at the bare bones of what's going on here. The difference is not that Abraham was better than Abimelech. The difference was that Abraham had a better God than Abimelech. That's the difference. The only thing that set Abraham apart from Abimelech in this situation was not his morality, but the greatness of the God who he was associated with. The reason why Abraham is going to get out of this so incredibly blessed despite his sin is because of the greatness of his God, not the greatness of his character. And that is also true for us Christians today. 
We too often think that our standing before God, that our blessings before the Lord, that God's uh, goodness to us, that his mercies to us are only new every morning as long as we have a green card. That they're only new and that they're only good as long as we do good things. But what we find here in Abraham is that Abraham was not really a great guy, but that his God was really a great God. The Israelites who are going to hear these stories and who have heard these stories and who are going to pass them down to their kids and their grandkids, who are going to have them written on their forehead, who are going to have them on the top of their door, they're going to say, see, we have a great God. We have a great God. Abraham made a mistake, and then he made it again. Look what he did to Abimelech. But where are the people of Abimelech? They're not here anymore, but we're here because we have Yahweh. When we look at Genesis, we need to see it as more than a manual on how we should behave. If it was a manual on how we should behave, it would be a terrible manual on how to behave because Abraham is going to turn out to be not that great of a guy and it's for the most part going to stay that way. But as we go through the book of Genesis, we are going to learn more and more about the greatness, not of Abraham, but of God. And we're going to recognize that our future, that our security, that our blessings are going to depend not on what we do, but on who we put our trust in. At the end of the day, at the end of chapter 20, Abraham had continued to put his trust in God. And despite his sin, God is protecting him, God is preserving him, and God is even still blessing him. Abimelech had it all. He had his women. He had his kingdom. He even did the noble thing in this situation. But not even a good thing is enough to earn God's grace, and a bad thing is not so bad to lose God's grace. That's the point of this passage. There is nothing so good that someone apart from God can do to earn his love and to earn his favor. And there's not a single thing that someone who knows God can do that is so bad that they lose it. Maybe you are a person right now who you feel like you have a whole stack of red cards against you. That you feel like you have made the same mistake over and over again that you keep returning to substances, or you keep returning to foul language, or you keep falling into anger, or lust, or bitterness, or uh, ill treatment of your spouse, and you look at that and you just say, I do it again, and I do it again. Be encouraged by the fact that Abraham made the same mistakes more than once, and know that God still loved him despite that. We worship a God who is bigger than our recurring mistakes. God wants for us to shift our life from a three-dimensional, continual life of sin to a three-dimensional, continual life of faith. We're going to find ultimately from Abraham that the best thing about him was his faith in God and that it was his faith that was counted to him as righteousness. Not him being a good husband being counted to him as righteousness, lucky for Abraham. Not him being an honorable, honest person that was counted as righteousness, lucky for Abraham, but his faith in God that was counted as righteous. That's what was true for him. It needs to be what was true for us. People may look at Bayview Bible Church and they may say, yeah, that church, they do this and they do that. And did you hear what that pastor did or what that pastor said? Or this person goes to the church, but let me tell you all the bad things he's done. We can look them in the eye and say, it doesn't matter because we may not be good, but our God is good and we want you to know our good God. Let's do that, everyone. And we can turn them to Genesis 20 and say, hey, here's a guy named Abraham who was just like us. Pray with me.